Here's my picture. And now uh, I'm making this picture in the 3D. That's why I draw this parallel pipette. That's this box to give you the impression of the 3D. We're having this three blue, uh, sorry, two blue vectors which span a plane. So that's a plane which is which go in, in the direction of these two vectors. And the question which I want to address is this one. How do I find the distance from the tip of the third vector like this to the plane like here? Of course, if I just try to model my approach to the question where there was a line instead of the plane, I have to first address the question how to find this perpendicular vector. How to drop a perpendicular from the tip of the vector onto a plane. If I keep just repeating the steps we did with you with the lines, all I should do is something like this. I should introduce... Uh, I should consider, in fact, uh, all possible distances, all of them, from the tip of this vector to the plane down here, like this. I try to picture this. So you drop all of these possible perpendiculars. I just, no, no sorry, not, not perpendiculars, that's the wrong word. All of these possible segments, all of these lines to the plane, and from, from the variety of all of these dashed lines, you have to choose the one which has a minimal length. Is it something we did with you with the line, remember, last time? So if I try to follow the same path with the plane, let's just see what happens. So sh what should I do? All of these points here, oops, sorry. All of these points here on my plane, all of them can be given in, the, in like these distances, in fact, let me just give you the expression for the distances straight away. All of these distances, I can express in the, in the form like this. The u vector, that's the one, the u vector is the one that's a black vector. Let me just put a name next to it. Here's my u vector. This is the vector a1. This is the vector a2. So these two bits, xa1 plus xa2, these are the vectors which will come up here in my plane for different x and y's. Remember, this is the parameterization for the plane. This is the vector equation for the plane, something we discussed with you before. Uh, these combinations will give me all possible vectors in the plane like this. If I take the difference with my fixed u vector, it will be these dashed lines or dashed vectors. If I take the length of those vectors, this is, the, this is a quantity we're looking at. And our objective is to minimize that quantity. That's, that's, the, that's the recipe which was so successful with the line, isn't it? We did, something, we, we did something like this, and we come up with the two beautiful results. On one hand, we come up with the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and we also come up with the formula for the projection. So now our hopes are really high whether this will help us to do something with the plane this time. Let's just see. So if you remember the technical steps we followed after we introduced the function like this. We expanded this, right? We just replaced this with the inner product of this expression with itself. Something like this is the vector repeated once, here's the vector repeated twice, brackets, dot product, everything looks nice. Now I do the expansion. Uh, I will do the sort of the speedy expansion this time. I'm going to put the ev every intermediate step because it's, it's a rather lengthy expression and I want to save some time. Uh, but I, I hope you can reconstruct all those missing details without my help. So if I do the expansion, uh, this term, it will be the dot product of this one with this one. This one is obviously the dot product of this piece with this piece. This one is a mixed dot product of a, uh, this, this piece with this one and this one with this one. That's why we got double here. Uh, we still go on. This one is uh, u times this piece or this u times this piece. Again, double. And then I think that's the two another ones, again the same story when u goes with this piece and the symmetrical one, that's why we have double, and then u with itself is this last one. If you remember our steps in our line treatment, you know that then we try to see some standard function in this expression. I can do something like this, I can just, if you let me replace all of these numbers, all of these numbers in front of my unknown x and y with some letters, Basically, I see the following structure in this function. Here's the structure. My capital A stands for this. My capital B stands for this. My capital C stands for this inner product. 
D obviously stands for this inner product, E capital E stands for this inner product, and F stands for this number. If I just hide this vector forms under this capital letters, then I see a sort of a quadratic function again, but the problem is this function is of two variables, isn't it? I mean, when we, when we minimize the function like this in case of a line, we relied on our very good knowledge of parabolas, functions of one variables of square type, and we know so much about those functions that the answer was immediate, right? We know where the function takes the minimum, we know exactly how to find this point where the function takes the minimum. Now, if you ask you the same question, do we know the same piece of information about the quadratic function of two variables? Do we know how to find the points where we can minimize this function? How to find those points? What's the value the function delivering those points? Do we have the answers to that? Do we? At this stage of your career, probably you don't. But probably you're moving towards that. There is, an, there, is a, there is analysis of functions of many variables which address these kind of questions, how to minimize the functions of many variables, how to find the extreme values, and all these sort of analytical questions are very well addressed there. But even now, you have to trust me at this stage, even if you have that information, it won't be that easy to minimize this function of two variables. Maybe one day when you, when you have that information, it's a, we normally teach that in the second year, function of several variables, if you, by any chance, remember this discussion, you can come, you can try come back to this and try to minimize this function after you have all of that machinery of functions of many variables. Even, even in that case, I don't think it would be that easy. I know actually it, it wouldn't be that easy. So how are we going to address this issue? Linear algebra, the one which we study with you today, does this in the following fashion. It makes this extra simplifying assumption on the underlying vectors a1 in a2. If we have this extra assumption, then things become immediately so easy, then you don't have any functions of many variables at all. This is, I mean, whoever did this first time, whoever come up with this extra assumption, which simplified things so tremendously, he was a genius. I'm just repeating his steps. That's where the geni ingenuity comes, actually. Not everyone is capable of these kind of things. But this, the assumption goes like this. It says, let's just assume... Hmm, Let's just make the assumption. I'll say right now the term, which you're probably not familiar with, but I'll explain it in a second. Uh, officially speaking, this is called like this. Let's just assume that A1 and A2 is orthonormal system. It's a, it might be a very scary term, but in fact, it's a very simple thing. So what do we normally mean? We have, you have to know this term anyway, so it just, it's a good opportunity for me to introduce this term. So people normally call a system of vectors it, not, it, it, should, I mean, uh, it, it is not necessarily a system of two elements. It may be more than two elements. In fact, more often it's, it's more than two elements. A system of vectors, and here's the definition. If I have a vectors, a1, a2, and an, and I call this system I call this system orthonormal if the system meets two requirements. First one, Every vector is a unital one, so it has the length one. That's my short way to write this. You see the index k takes the values from 1 to n. And the second one is that vectors, two different vectors, any pair of two different vectors, they are perpendicular to each other. If k and j, any numbers, any indices between 1 and n, and they are not equal to each other. If you have such an extra piece of information about your system of vectors, you will call the system the orthonormal. And that's what we're going to do with my two vectors a1 and a2. We're going to assume they are on the top of just everything else. They are orthonormal system, meaning that each of them individually, unital, and they're perpendicular to each other. In this case, if you look back at my function, my function will, simplify, will be simplified tremendously, right? This one will be 1. This coefficient will be 1. This will be 0. There will be something in here. There will be something here. There will be something in here. But at least these three first three coefficients, they will take much more simpler form than, than before. Here will be 1. Here will be 1. And we don't have any mixed product anymore. So the function then, that's how my function will be under the assumption that the system is orthonormal. Who knows how... Now, 
back to the origin, original problem, we have to minimize this function. Do we know how to minimize this function? I mean, do this extra piece of the information that the mixed product disappeared from the from the function? Does it make the things uh, does does it make the things simpler? It does. You think? Why? How do you see the solution now? Go ahead. That's nice. Nice. Who knows how to frame it be in a better way? Because circle, not really. I don't like the term circle here. What's the what's the procedure we have to do in order to see your circle? What's the official name for the procedure? Thank you very much. Completion of the squares. We can complete the squares now because x and y totally separated. We can complete the squares here and here and here and here. And then the function will take the form like this. And that's it. But that's not this. What, 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 who knows what's the shape of the function? I mean, if you picture this function in the say, in any 3D picturing software like Maple, Mathematica, or in your heads, which we know much more powerful than Maple and Mathematica together, what, what kind of shape that will take? Do you know the name for this shape? It will be circular. Circular what? Circular paraboloid, probably, no? So when you take a, you, you never heard that term? Circular paraboloid, it says when you take a parabola, you take the axis and start spinning this parabola around this axis, the shape you come up with, like a, like a tumble, that will be the, which is shaped as a parabola, and if you cut across it, that's the, what is called a circular paraboloid, and that's a typical example of a circular paraboloid. Just on a side note, do you know the very, very important and very famous optical property of the circular paraboloid? How can I expect something if you've never heard of a circular paraboloid, right? Everything goes this way from one point. Yeah, circular paraboloids, it's the shapes uh, which are normally used for antennas, like a satellite antennas or headlights of your cars, because uh, they have a special point which is called the focal point. Everything, every beam of light which comes out of the focal point after reflection from the circular paraboloid will take the direction parallel to the axis, axis of a circular parabola. It's the very important and famous property of the circular paraboloids. Well, that's beyond the current discussion. Well, from our point of view, we know how to minimize this function now because we know we have we have two we have two sum of the two squares, and uh, that's the only place where x and y are sitting, right? So if I want to minimize this by changing changing the values of x and y, obviously I have to choose those x and y's which will vanish this square and will vanish this square, and that will be the point which will minimize my function, and that will be the point those two parameters x and y. I have to scale my a1 and a2 in order to come up with the projection vector here. <coughs> and now I can write the answer. So if I want to minimize my function, I have to choose x equal d and y equal e. And the minimal value of my function will take the value f take d square take e square. All of these capital letters, we know what they stand for. They stand for some pieces in my original expression here. And so if I want to see the expression, the direct expression for the projection of my vector u onto, you see this time I put here as a subscript, I put here capital S, that's just the abbreviation for my whole plane here. If I want to see the projection, now the direct formula for the projection will be, here it is. This is my capital D from here. This is my capital E from here, and I'm scaling my A1 with this vector. Right, and that's the formula. It's not so direct as it was for the projection onto a line, because you see, it relies on the fact that your system A1 and A2 is orthonormal system. It is not always so. However, the good news is there is a method of converting any system of vectors into the orthonormal system without affecting the projection. This goes, of course, beyond the current topic. It's a second year, second year subject. Second year subject. I mean, converting the system to the orthonormal system is called the Gram-Schmidt process. It's called the Gram-Schmidt process. You can easily Google that. Wikipedia has a beautiful page on that. If you're wondering, you can check that. Uh, however, for our purposes, what we discovered with you, in case my system of vectors is orthonormal up front, then the value for the projection onto a plane can be found 
like this. And that's good enough for our purposes. Okay, now remember, the reason I just brought this up is the, my original intention was to find the distance between the tip of the vector and the plane. Let me ask you this. Does anyone in this class see another way to find this distance without using the projection of the u vector onto the plane spanned by a1 and a2? Do you see any other way to do the same problem without actually using the projection of the vector u onto the plane? There is another way to do it. Listen to this. Rather than, rather than projecting my u, rather than dropping the perpendicular on my plane, spanned by a1 and a2, what I can do is this. I can take a vector here, perpendicular to my a1 and a2. We know how to construct that vector. We did a tutorial question with you actually last time on this. Actually, not tutorial question. It was a question I comment on, commented on very last moment. Like the, the last subject we discussed last time was exact, exactly this, how to find a vector perpendicular to the given two. Actually, it's one of my, my most popular videos on YouTube, which is quite unexpected. <laughs> I don't know why people are so interested in that subject. I don't know. Maybe everyone is finding the projections. Anyway, if you can find this vector, then rather than projecting here, we can project here onto this vector. And that would be easier because this time we will be projecting on one vector on the line rather than the plane. We, don't, we won't be needing all of, this, all of these things because we will be projecting on one single vector. So what I'm saying is this. If I by any means find a vector perpendicular to my original a1 and a2, and if I project that way, then the distance, the distance I'm after will be just the length of this projection. So what I'm saying is this. Uh, well, this distance vector, the one which gives the distance, it's the one which is given by like this. It's a u take the projection, and that's, that's what we are after, to find the distance. So rather than following this way, we can find this vector, by projecting u vector on the vector h, where h is the vector perpendicular to my a1 and a2 simultaneously. So h is a vector perpendicular to a1 and perpendicular to a2. This is another way to do that. Much simpler way. You don't need any assumptions about the orthogonality. You need nothing. You just—it's a basically it's a computational pathway towards the answer. It's a long pathway because it's a two-stage pathway. You have to find the vector perpendicular to a1 in a2, and then use the formula for the projection. But still, it's doable. I mean, there is a conceptual problem with this method. It's not something which is going to affect you in this topic. But this is this method when you take the perpendicular vector to a1 and a2 and you drop the perpendicular on this vector. It's a, it's a. It's a vector which works only in three dimensions. In higher dimensions, it's no longer, it's not gonna work anymore. So this method, it's the one which you probably will be relying on most of the time when you do something like this in your tutorial questions. When you find the distance from a point to a plane, 